Well, good morning. If you want to turn to Acts uh, chapter 13, that's where we are currently in our series, uh, Neighbourhoods to Nations. And uh, I thought by way of just kind of uh, catching up with where we, we, we are right now in chapter 13, we might look at a map and just see what's been going on by way of just setting the scene. The church started in Jerusalem, the Spirit fell, the disciples went out onto the streets, uh, the Jews there began to respond to the gospel. The church grew uh, really by its thousands. Uh, then there was a persecution. Uh, the believers got scattered. They went as, kind of as far as Antioch up the top there. And they began to start sharing the gospel with those that weren't kind of Jewish. Uh, and people were responding. They were, they were accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior they were being added to the church. And down in Jerusalem, they thought, wow, something, something exciting is going on there. And they sent this guy Barnabas up to take a look. Barnabas goes up from Jerusalem to Antioch. And we read that he saw the grace of God. He saw God's grace among them, which is the kind of the, the key thing they wanted to see. Are people responding to a message about what God has done for them in Jesus? Are they, are they receiving what God has done for them in Jesus? Or are they just trying harder? Are they just trying to, is it another moralizing kind of deal? Is it, a, is it a, about being good enough for God? Or is this the real gospel that they've got hold of, these kind of non-Jews? Are they believing in Jesus and receiving his life, death, and resurrection for them? And up goes Barnabas, and indeed he saw the grace of God amongst them. Because you can see it, when that message is amongst the people, you can see it. It looks different. It changes people from the inside out. And Barnabas loved it. He saw the grace of God. And uh, in fact, they wanted to, he saw the nations being added in to, uh, to the church. And he wanted to put some foundations on that. He could see that these people were responding to Jesus, but he wanted to, to teach into that and explain uh, from beginning to end, really, the Old Testament, the new revelation that, that had come through the apostles about Jesus. He wanted to kind of dig that into them, to put strong foundations into this church. And so he goes and gets uh, Saul from Tarsus, uh, later called Paul. He goes and gets his friend, and they come back, and they spend a significant amount of time teaching the church. And then we get prophets arriving in the church, and the prophets are saying there's going to be a famine coming. There's a time of difficulty coming. And so the church decide, hey, we want to help our brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And so as they are able, as they, as they have provision for themselves, they give. They, they give their money and their, their resources. And Paul and Saul, uh, sorry, Paul and Barnabas are sent back down to Jerusalem with uh, the, the, an, an offering there, the, the resources to help the church. And we pick up the story when they've just come back. In uh, chapter 12, verse 23, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they completed their service. Oh, bringing with them a John, whose other name was Mark. And I think some people say that's the kind of the John who wrote the, the gospel, perhaps, uh, bearing his name. Uh, so let's read on then. Let's, now we're ready to read in chapter 13. And really, this is, a, this is a key moment in the, in the life of the church. This is a significant moment, in fact, in the book of Acts. I'm not sure if it's exactly kind of halfway through or not. Um, it's kind of round, round about. There's, the focus is about to change from Peter and Jerusalem to really the gospel exploding around the world. This is the moment we kind of see, perhaps, you know, when, when you watch explosions, you kind of like to see them in slow motion, or I do. You begin to see there's an explosion that's beginning to happen here in this chapter. And it's going to explode around the world. And indeed, it's come to us. And this is really where this kind of explosion begins. The, the gospel has gone out to Jews, and now it's about to kind of go worldwide. So it's really, really important for us to, to look here and see and take a moment what actually is happening so that it keeps happening again and again and again. It happens in our church here in Norwich, that it happens in our life groups, it happens in our lives. What is it that happened here? We want to see it continually reproduced, this wonderful, glorious explosion of the grace of God going out around the world. So hopefully that kind of uh, focuses you in and whets your appetite and gets your attention as we read now in chapter 13. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, 
Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And uh, we, you can see that on the map there. We, you know where Cyprus is, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> it helps me anyway. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as uh, Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that um, is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately a mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of of the Lord. It's a really exciting passage, I'm sure you'll agree. And it's, uh, I was actually quite tempted to spend the bulk of our time in the second part of that, what happens on Cyprus. There's lots of kind of, it's a, 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 the spiritual battle that takes place here in the courts of power as uh, the gospel was proclaimed that left one man blind and another man believing. I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of exciting things there. It'd be good to talk about. But really what I wanted to do was I wanted to see what led to that. Because those sorts of things might happen, but lots of other sorts of things might happen for us as well. What led to that kind of e explosion of spiritual power that took place there? What, was, what caused it? And perhaps we can look and see what would cause it in our own lives. What's the kind of context that we might have amongst us that would lead to us being propelled out into those kinds of situations and seeing the kind of things that they saw then? Perhaps not exactly the same, but just as significant and important. And it seems to me, I don't know about you, but as I kind of read these first few verses, as I look back and say, what, what, how, how did that happen? What kicked that whole thing off? The words that kind of jump out to me are, the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit said. That's the basis of all of this. That's, that's what led to this, uh, this exciting encounter happening. The Holy Spirit said. And this is God speaking. And it seems to me that I thought it would be helpful to look at what, what, what were the context into which the Holy Spirit spoke? How can we cultivate a, a church where the Holy Spirit's voice, the voice of God, is heard more and more among us? What characterized this church in Antioch such that the Holy Spirit's voice was heard, heard so clearly amongst them? And let's see if we can ask God to strengthen these things in us. Well, the first thing that I kind of... So I'm just looking really at the first two verses here. So, um, yeah, verses 1 and 2. Just kind of picking out some of the things really in order that seem to be significant. As we hear this, the Holy Spirit said, what characterized the church there in Antioch? And the first thing it seems to me is it speaks about the church in Antioch. There was a church in Antioch. If you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you're part of the worldwide church church. It's kind of that just happens. You may, you may not have realized it, but that's, that's the reality of it. And yet, this, this reality is to be expressed in a church. And here in, in Norwich is a, a church, King's Church. There was a church in Antioch. There was an actual body of believers. They were, there was an, an actual gathering. They, were, they could look left and right and see brothers and sisters that were actually part of that church in Antioch. They were, part, just, they were part of the, kind of the, the worldwide church, part of the, the believers in Jerusalem. But here was a concrete manifestation of the church that people could see in that city and to, and to which they belonged. They knew, I belong to this church. I'm part of this church. These are the leaders in this church. This is what we are doing together. Real kind of 
actual people left and right of them who were part of the, the expression of God's family in the world. They were part of a concrete church. And then it seems to me it's really imp- important that the voice of the Holy Spirit comes. God speaks to, to a church, to a, a body of believers. God's voice is heard in a church, in a particular local church. God spoke to the church in Antioch. Barnabas and Saul, indeed, were sent out from the church in Antioch, a particular church. They reported back to the church in Antioch. They were connected with that church. And so the question for us is, the question for you, are you part of a local church? If you're a believer, wonderful that you're part of the worldwide church, but are you part of a local church? Are you expressing that truth so that people can see it and so that you can get the benefit of it and that you can hear God's voice to you in the context of a local church? We'd love it if it was kings, of course, but but there are plenty of great churches around the city and maybe you're from somewhere else. I'll just encourage you, based on what I'm hearing here and seeing here, if you want to hear God's voice to you clearly, the place to be is part of a local church with actual people gathering together, led by actual identifiable leaders on a mission together. They were part of a church. Your ability to hear what God says and do it is grounded in your connection with a local church. If you want to hear God loud and clear, be part of a local church. If you you want to be where God's voice, a place where God's voice reverberates, you know, like you have a, a, a string, don't you? You can pluck a string and you can sort of hear it, but you put it on a, on a guitar, it, it magnifies it, you can hear it more clearly, there's a richness to it, and so God's voice is heard richly and clearly in the context of a local church. If you want your fruitfulness for God to be maximized, the context is the local church. The Holy Spirit speaks in the context of the, holy, of the, of the local church, but how did God speak? Well, there are all sorts of ways that God speaks, and I've, you've been on the Alpha course, you would have heard the I don't know how, I can't remember how many there are. The CSs, there's uh, the commanding scripture that God speaks from his word, through his word. Circumstantial signs, you know, things happen and they're not coincidence often. Think, well, that, that was, we I mean, heard this morning that uh, Linda came in and, with that song in, in, her, in her mind. There was, a, there was a kind of coincidence there, but it wasn't just a coincidence. It was God was kind of joining some dots there, highlighting something that he wanted to say and wanted to do. So circumstantial signs, counsel of the saints, where God can speak to us through one another, just through kind of wisdom or words of encouragement that we might bring, all these other kind of things. I can't remember what the other ones were. But, there's, but here we're seeing, I believe in this context, that God was speaking through prophetic ministry. There were prophets there in the church in Antioch. Prophets. Now, we can all hear, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, you, you can hear Jesus. It's just that is the truth. You might say, well, I don't know, I hear God. You, yes, you can hear God if you're a, a believer. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. You, you do. Often we kind of discount it and say, oh, that, no, that's not what, that, it, I know. You read the Bible, that's God speaking to you. But also God can speak to us sometimes audibly, sometimes just kind of a word in our heart. Sometimes he puts thoughts in our mind and we learn to discern. I think that's, I think that's the Lord speaking to me. I think that's the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And it's something that you can grow in. And it's actually only as you step out and speak with others and, and test these things that you get to hear his voice more clearly. But all of us, it's our, it's our birthright. If you're a believer, you hear the voice of God. All of us can hear God's voice to a certain extent, to different degrees. But the thing that God loves to do is he loves to speak to us through others. He, doesn't just, he, he loves to speak to us directly. And that's a precious thing, the quiet voice of God in our, in our heart. But he, he actually is built in that we need to hear from him through one another to build a wonderful interdependence in his body, the church, so that we're not an isolated individual with a kind of a hotline to, to, to God. Of course, we can hear the voice of our Heavenly Father. We can hear Jesus. We can hear the, vo- the voice of the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, we, we, wa- we wonderfully need to hear from God from one another. And this is the prophetic gift that he would speak to me to to share with you. He would speak to you to share with me. And in this way, there's a wonderful interdependence and a building together that happens in the body, God's church. Oh, I wrote down here, uh, I need you and you need me. But um, does that that ring a bell to anybody? It's the young ones, isn't it? And uh, I decided not to say that. But uh, is it just me? Um, But I need you, you need me. 
I need you. You need me. It's just the way it is. That's why we need to be part of a local church, a church in Norwich, because I, I, need to, I hear God through you, and you hear God through me. That's how he's, he's made it to be, not isolated individuals. You want to hear the voice of God, then be part of a local church. Now, I, I, recently, I, kind of, I really needed to hear from God, and I, I can hear from God, just as you can hear from God. But I knew that I need to put myself amongst others that hear from God and say to them, please, would you, would you pray for me? Please, would you kind of share with me what you think God is saying to you? Sometimes we just need to particularly put ourselves in that prophetic environment where others can encourage us. And uh, so we pressed into that, and indeed, God did speak through others. And when, when he does that, it brings a wonderful, it's often a confirmation. It's often not something kind of hugely new. It may not have been a bolt out of the blue that they said separate, for, 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 that God said send, send off Saul and, um, and Barnabas. They may have been kind of thinking about that. What's the next step? How do we work this out? Well, who do we send out? It may have been confirmation of what they were already beginning to think about. Maybe it was new. I don't know. But often when God speaks to us, it's kind of part of a picture of what God is saying to us. And it's now, yeah, I felt God kind of staring and saying that, but now I hear it through someone else who had no idea of my circumstance. That kind of, the pieces begin to snap together. Faith begins to rise. Now I begin to see that God is with me. And my heavenly Father's aware of my situation. He's encouraging me. It's a wonderful strength that comes as we prophesy for one another. It confirms, and again, it builds this interdependence. The, the, I, mean, I don't know about you, you've probably got your own story, but the fact that I'm here, doing what I'm doing, is because God spoke through others about leaving my job, a, a previous job, about stepping into leadership. God spoke. And so when challenging times come, and that's tested, I think, no, I remember God spoke. This, is something, this wasn't a nice idea that, that somebody had or that I thought of. or that you know, It wasn't a human deal. God said something. The Holy Spirit spoke. And that puts kind of concrete beneath your feet. I'm sure it's the same for you. If you think about it, wonderfully, we've been able to just kind of send out to Toby and Jean to serve in, in Lowestoft. God spoke. That's, that's why that's happening. M a multi-site, kind of like different sites around the city. God spoke. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy when you step into it, but you can look back and remember. Now, this is the Holy Spirit said, and faith rises and strength comes, and there's a sense of God's presence with you as you step out. Perhaps years later, you look back upon this foundation, the Holy Spirit said, such a powerful way that God works amongst us as we hear his voice. We all hear from God. We can all, to a certain extent as well, share with one another what we think God is saying. But nevertheless, there becomes a point where the, the, this prophetic gift thing so shapes us is so much a part of, of who an individual is. They're, kind of, they're just kind of prophesying in their sleep almost. It's, just, it's become part of, not, not their identity, but, but it's shaped their life to a certain extent that it, begin, it becomes to be obvious that they themselves are a gift to the church from Jesus. It's just that they are a, a prophet. We can all prophesy, but wonderfully, there was a maturity and a... And a, and a a, a maturing of this gifting in this church where people recognize that this, this is a, a gift from God to us as a church, this person here. And this, I think, begins to touch on what it is when, when we, we see there were prophets there. It wasn't that there were some people who were prophesying and some people that weren't. I suspect there was a, a wonderful kind of uh, chorus of prophecy going on. But there was a maturity that had grown in this church that there were some that were uh, recognized as prophets and we, want to, we, we all of us want to grow in this gifting. We all of us want to be stepping out more and just, we're going to get it wrong. It, it, it doesn't matter because you, we do it carefully and, with, and with, in proportion to our faith. I just, I feel God might be saying this to you. I don't know if that kind of makes sense with other things that he might be, might be saying. We just we step out, we encourage one another. I just felt this scripture on my heart for you. I don't know if it's Get helpful to you, just felt to kind of bring it. We, I mean, we're seeing it in operation on, on Sundays, but this is the tip of the iceberg. We, this is going on in our life groups, in our, in our, with our friends, maybe even in work situations. We're just thinking, I just felt this. I just wondered whether this is something that might help you. Stepping out in this gift, that's the way to grow. That's the way to mature in this gifting, that we would see prophets among us, arise among us. But it's significant to me now that going on to the next word here, that. It doesn't just say there were prophets in Antioch, but there were teachers in Antioch. It's not just prophets, but teachers. And if we were trying to distinguish these two uh, kind of groups in some way, they may well have been overlapping. 
His prophetic ministry is particularly focused on perhaps what new revelation that God is saying. Something Maybe it's just in the timing of it, but there's something kind of new about it. Whereas teaching is more broadly focused on what God has already revealed. It's trying to help people understand the ramifications of it, what it means, how it kind of fits together. So there were, there were prophets and teachers in this church. This, we're looking at these things really to understand how they heard God so clearly, such that it led to such spectacular gospel advance. And it seems to me that not only do we need prophets in the church, but we need teachers in the church. We need both prophets and teachers. Because as God speaks, it needs to be, we need to hear in a context where there's a good foundation of the, of the truth of what God has already said, what has already been revealed. And we have that supremely, of course, in his word. To as, as prophets kind of declare what God is saying, we'd say, does this line up with God's word? Does this line up with what we already know that God has said? And the way to do that is not to ask for the first time to kind of flick through the Bible, but for teachers to have laid a strong foundation in the church just so that we, we all of us know the voice of God. We know what God has said in his word. We're, 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 we're sorted with that. It, it allows us wonderfully to hear with great precision and to weigh and to filter what God is saying through this prophetic gifting. We need both prophets and teachers. Our fallible prophetic words need to be weighed in the light of our best understanding of God's infallible written word. Our fallible prophetic words need to be weighed in the light of our best understanding of God's infallible written word. And that's not to denigrate prophecy. That's, that's, just to, that's, to, that's to, to lift it up and say, this is, this is like gold to us. This is gold, but we don't just kind of grab our hand full of mud from a river and just say, this is all gold. We look for the gold. We sift for the gold. And we do that with what God has already uh, declared and revealed of himself in his word. We need both teachers and prophets. Te a good teaching in a church helps muffle inaccurate prophetic words. It helps kind of just dial them down. Now, that doesn't sound like something that God is saying. It doesn't fit with what we already know. Pardon me, what we already know that God has said. But on the other side of it, good teaching in a church helps magnify what God has said, what God is saying prophetically to us. Again, it's it just like, hey, this, see how this fits in with the bigger picture. See how this fits in with what God has already said. It adds, adds weight to it. A true prophetic word, but we need prophets and teachers together. And in fact, I think that's a big part of this church here in Antioch. And I guess because there were a lot of non-Jews, I, I think, in this church. So they, they needed teaching. They didn't have a lot of, perhaps a lot of them, this kind of uh, deep grounding in the Old Testament scriptures and what God had revealed. And that's why Barnabas and Saul, both of them, they spent a year or so, I think it was, in this church, laying a good foundation so that when God spoke prophetically, they could hear it, they could discern the voice of God. That's why we spend time here. We, we, we go through God's word. We're working through Acts right now so as to lay a good foundation so that all of us would know what God has already said and we would be able to get the benefit of it and the, the strengthening from it. But also it wonderfully allows us to hear what God is saying as he speaks to us by the Spirit, even as we've gathered here today, but in all kind of different settings that we are in. So we prize uh, the prophetic. We prize this teaching gift amongst us. But moving on now, just to the, there's a whole bunch of names here. And really what that, a couple of things that says to me, first of all, it says to me that there was teams in place here. There wasn't a prophet and a teacher. There wasn't one person that was being looked to as, oh, they're the prophet. There wasn't one person who was the teacher. That's not how God does things. That's not how he builds his church, the body. There were teams of prophets. There were teams of teachers. There were different ones setting this foundation, different ones hearing God together and bringing direction to the church in this way. And we want to see that here too. We want to see teams of, of, of teachers, teams of prophets, teams of people hearing from God, not just build around one person. There's something of the spirit where there's, there's teams working together in this way. And building upon that, the next thing that this, this list of names tells me is there's a, there's a wonderful, glorious ethnic and social diversity, not just of gifting, but of background and of culture that is, uh, I, I think we can see in these names. Because Paul was a Jewish rabbi. Barnabas, a Cypriot Jew. Commentators reckon that Simeon was probably a black African. Uh, Lucius was 
a North African, uh, probably, and his name sounds um, Latin to me, so maybe a gentle, Gentile background there. And Menaean was, we had royal connections. I'm not sure whether that meant he was a slave in the royal household or whether he was, I don't know, I don't know what his status was, but there, were, there was a mix of people here. They weren't all from the same place, the same background. There was a wonderful mix of, of difference here. And this speaks to me of the work of the Holy Spirit, where it's not just a group of the same people saying the same. There's, you know, this is the opposite of an echo chamber. You know what an echo chamber is? It's, where it's a group of people who are the same, who are saying the same thing to each other, and it's just bouncing off the walls, and it's, just, it's all contained within this box. When God speaks, it's the opposite of an echo chamber. He speaks to a wonderful variety of different people from different backgrounds in different ways, and he speaks from outside the box into that diversity. This is a mark of the Spirit. This is how God loves to speak. And so we want to cultivate that hair as different ones from different backgrounds, different experiences, different, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole range of differences, but yet we're united by the Spirit as we reach across these differences and connect with one another. And it doesn't happen overnight. There's a unity of the Spirit which is there for the taking, but it takes time to cultivate and to, to, to manifest and to build amongst us as we, we spend time over, over meals together, as we, as we love one another, as we walk with one another. But in this diversity is where we hear God, the voice of God into the church through the diversity of God's people from the nations. And here it began to, to happen wonderfully at Antioch. We don't want an echo chamber. We want a place where the Holy Spirit's voice is heard clearly and discerned. And uh, just to, I'll just touch on these two last things briefly now. This is really important. W when did they hear God? What was the context in which they heard God? It's while they were worshipping. While they were worshipping, the Holy Spirit said to them. Their main focus was not on something new. Their main focus was not on, here we, let, let's God see what the next novel thing is. Let's, let's, even the focus wasn't, let's see what God would say to us next in terms of bringing direction. Their focus was on who God had already revealed himself to be in the person of Jesus. And it had so captured their hearts and minds that they could think of nothing better than to do than to worship him with abandon. They already knew who he was. They already knew what he had done. They already knew what he would do. They, there's, and in that context, God can speak about some details. But do you, do you understand, there wasn't this desperate need to, to, to hear. This was the context. They were worshiping God in the richness of what he had already revealed to them in Jesus. This is the context in which we can hear God's voice most clearly. This is the best context to hear God's voice as we worship as we acknowledge what he has already said, as we live in the good of what he has already said, as we proclaim what he has already said, we're in a good position to hear what he is saying to us. And that's wonderfully happened this morning, a demonstration about God. We, we, we kind of knew some of these things, but there's a, there's a kind of a nowness that comes. There's a, a wonderful experience of God's presence and God's voice among us. There's different ones feel prompted by the Spirit at different times to come and bring kind of a particular articulation to them as God has stirred them. Isn't that been wonderful to hear different things emphasized? That's because God, and he said to us even this morning, he knows our situation right now. He knows what you're going through right now. It's not that he kind of guessed 2,000 years ago when some of this was written that there might be some people vaguely in your situation. He knows right now the situation you're in and he wants to speak to you right now. And wonderfully he's done that through different ones of us here this morning. But it was in the context of worshipping. You see, we, we first came together and we lifted our hands and our eyes together and we worshipped God for who he has declared him to be in the person of Jesus. And we thanked him for his grace and his mercy to us. And that's when he speaks. That's the context in which he speaks to his sons and daughters. And of course, in our different settings and situations as well. I'm going to ask the band to come back as I just touch finally on this, uh, just this last one just to have a minute on it, because it's, uh, it's important. They were worshipping the Lord. They recognized what he had already done, but they were worshipping the Lord and fasting because they realized there was so much more that needed to be done. There was so much more of God's 
grace that was to be poured out in this world. They were, they were, they were worshipping, but I suspect they were also weeping as they looked around them, as indeed many of us are right now, as we, we celebrate what God has done and what God is doing in us, but we see there's so much more, and there's such great need in this world, and say they were fasting because there was a need of God, and fasting kind of expresses, and it turns up the, the contrast, it turns up the intensity, it expresses in a deeper way, oh God, we need you, we need to hear your voice to us, that you would speak to us, that, that we would be a part of what you're doing in response to the need that we see around, that we would be part of your kingdom being extended and your church being built. What would you have us do? They were fasting, they were worshiping, you see, these two things go together, worshiping for who Jesus is and what he's done, and a fasting. God, would you do it? Would your kingdom come and speak to us that we'd be a part of it? So I hope that's helpful. There's some wonderful kind of principles here for us. And as I look at them, they're in place wonderfully in many ways. But why don't we stand together and we'll pray that God would strengthen these things, that he would speak to us. Oh, Father, we love to hear your voice, and we've heard it this morning so wonderfully, and we want to say we prize that. This is important to us. It's gold to us. Father, your voice to us this morning has been such a source of encouragement, and we thank you for it. We thank you for those that have labored before us to, 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 to see this church established over the years, decades. God, we thank you that, that we have this context, that we could come this morning and gather together and hear your voice. We thank you for those that have labored and in teaching, laying a good foundation here. God, we thank you for those that have ministered to us prophetically. We thank you that all of us in different ways have been part of this, helping one another, teaching one another, bringing your word to one another, prophesying in different settings. God, we thank you for your voice heard amongst us. God, we thank you for those that help us to worship. Thank you for the, the band this morning and others that kind of to help us lift our hands and our eyes to you and delight ourselves and enjoy what you have already done and what you have already said. But Lord, our heart does break as we look around us. Our heart does break for where your kingdom needs to come. Lord, and we would call out to you, your kingdom come. God, would you speak to us for our strength and encouraging and comfort, but, but as you strengthen, encourage and comfort us, Lord, you have a, this, this, this happened, your voice spoke, the Holy Spirit spoke in the context of worldwide mission, that the whole earth would be filled with your glory. And we pray, would you speak to us again and again and again that you would catch us up in this worldwide mission to glorify yourself in all the earth. Oh God, we pray for those in desperate need around the world right now. We do pray for those in in countries like the Ukraine where there's such need. Others as well, Lord, that might be out in the spotlight right now, but God, we, we, we pray, we ask you, we worship you, but we fast and we pray that your kingdom would come. And Lord, open our ears that we would hear how you were directing us. This one over here, this one sent out over here, this, this put in place here, this ministry started, whatever it might be, Lord, we want to hear your voice. We thank you that we have, and so much of what we do is walking in the good of it. We, we just say we prize it, we thank you for it. Keep speaking to us, Heavenly Father, for your glory. In Jesus' name. Best thing we can do now is worship.